So I'm going to start by explaining something that we all know. Um, we have sensory organs, which allow us to perceive our surroundings, the reality that surrounds us. It allows us to perceive the world we live in, and it also leads us uh, through our lives by the release of dopamine. It's kind of as if we were addicts to senses, addicts to perception, and addicts to this release of dopamine, right? Uh, dopamine is uh, released each time we get rewarded by something, explaining it in a simple, super simplified way. And uh, we learn that system since the first moment uh, we start learning with our parents. They teach us that if we do something that's right, we'll get rewarded, so our dopamine will increase. And if we do something that's not right, we'll get punished, which is the complete uh, opposite. So it's kind of not in an hedonistic way, but it's kind of, of as if we were constantly looking for this uh, sensitive pleasure uh, surrounding us, right? There's something which happens with dopamine, that is that each time we get to make a task, each time we need to do something, uh, dopamine increases before we even get rewarded in order for us to be able to do that task, in order for us to properly function. Uh, so yeah, I found it really interesting. And also dopamine is highly related to sex drive, right? So. On 1960s, uh, the, this paper was released by the NASA. It's called Cyborgs in Space by Manfred E. Kleins and Nathan S. Klein. And it basically imagines what the future human would look like. Um, especially uh, when it comes to space traveling and when it comes to adapting the body to uh, out of our planet environments. So. Um, they imagined a human which would be joined with technology. This is where the word cyber comes from. Etymologically, it's a cybernetic and organism. Cybernetic as in technology, obviously, and organism as in our body. So they imagined a human that would have different devices implanted into their bodies in order to be able to uh, live in outer space and be able to make long-term space travel. So, for example, they imagined a self-drug a injectory device that would um, give nutrients to, to the human or to the cyborg in order for it to be nourished. They imagined another device that would give uh, melanin or melatonin uh, to, to make the human be able to hibernate, to sleep for long terms, and they also imagined a device that would give hormones in order to decrease dopamine levels and testosterone levels so that a cyborg wouldn't feel sex drive. So it's kind of like placing the human on a neutral state, uh, taking away all what makes a human be a human, right? Taking away all the animal parts of the human and just making this kind of being that is completely neutral in order to be able to live in space. So they thought it would be much more interesting to change the body to adapt to this environment instead of changing the surroundings. And also they thought it would be much more logical. Then we saw a change on the word cyborg and its meaning. Uh, you can see here two pictures of two artists. On my right, you can see a picture of Donna Haraway, who with her cyborg manifesto changed the meaning of the word cyborg and uh, changed this paradigm of the physicality of the word cyborg. Uh, now the cyborg world started being more a philosophical entity. She placed the cyborg as an entity, as a figure that was out of the binarism, that was out of those social constructs, of those rules that would make a man be a man, a woman be a woman, that would cage their identity. So that's the first time that we see the word cyborg being more kind of like a philosophical thing instead of just a physical invention or a theory about uh, the future. Then uh, on my left you can see a picture of uh, Stellark, 
who is uh, an artist, a performing artist, who started to play with mechatronics to make different performances, uh, started to work with his own body. In this picture, you can see him with uh, an ear on, on his left hand. It's not a functional ear, but together with biohacking, he started planning or presenting the idea that senses could be enhanced thanks to technology. So the word cyborg started having different meanings. As well as we have grown as humans, uh, we also have grown as uh, language speakers. It's like now we choose the meaning of our words. Now we can really create that, right? So uh, on the 2000s, we saw different ways of becoming a cyborg. There are some people that uh, would implant cameras on their eyes and would consider themselves a cyborg. Or there's people, for example, uh, these three people that I'm showing you on the picture, which I'll talk about uh, right now, who would augment their senses, enhance their senses, and would consider themselves cyborgs as well. So. First of all, you can see a picture of Neil Harbison. Uh, he was the father of cybergism right now, I would say, or at least for me, as he is my mentor. And uh, he implanted an antenna on his skull in order to be able to perceive colors. He was born with extreme Daltonism, and he can only see in black and white. So thanks to this antenna, he can perceive colors, and he can just, for example, walk to Tokyo, uh, go to Tokyo, and get on the metro and know the line he needs to take, or he can uh, interact with many other different things that we are super used to and that are color-based. Then in the middle, we can see a picture of Moon Rivas. She got implanted at the same time as Neil Harbison, and she implanted two devices on both of her feet in order to feel the seismic movement of the planet. She wanted to feel more connected to the Earth, and she's a dancer and a performer, so uh, she would dance to the movement of seismic uh, movements of, of our planet, and she is also a cyborg from, from sensory cyborgs, as I like to call them. Then we see a picture of Manel de Aguas. He's based in Barcelona too, and he created this device in order to feel atmospheric pressure changes on his environment, also to feel more connected to, to the Earth. So basically, their idea is that technology can make us more animal-like, can connect us more with Earth and with nature itself. They teach me that Rebuilt reality means being able to perceive much more than what we know exists thanks to our five senses. And they also teach me that it's not the same as augmented reality or artificial intelligence. Because if it was artificial intelligence, for example, they would have a machine telling them uh, all the, uh, what they are perceiving. No? For example, Neil would have an antenna that would tell him this is co uh, red color, this is yellow color, but uh, he perceives it through musical notes. So it's kind of like learning a new language. One day um, I met Neil Harbison and Moon Rivas and they asked me if I wanted to create a cybernetic sense myself, which I said yes, obviously. I had been interested in uh, outer space since I was really young. Here you can see a picture of me uh, in 2009. I was nine years old and I was uh, teaching my classmates about the, the different planets of, of the solar system. And uh, at that time I was really interested in outer space because because uh, in, in school I had many problems with other kids, so I kind of needed a safe environment for me to innovate. And uh, I thought outer space would be much more comfortable than my own house. Uh, or or that's, that's what I thought at that time. So this is when I started to get interested in outer space. So obviously when Neil and Moon proposed the idea of creating a cyborg sense, I said yes, because that was the only way I could go to outer space without the need of moving from my planet. My dream had always been to get on a rocket, but we all know it's uh, not quite possible at the time, so it was much more easier and realistic to create a cybernetic sense. So this is how I started working on the cosmic sense, which you can see on the pictures. It's a cybernetic sense that allowed me to perceive cosmic rays uh, in musical notes. So it, it would catch cosmic rays and it would translate those cosmic rays into musical notes depending on how far they come from our planet. 
I did many prototypes until the day 4th of November of 2019, I could finally test it on. And uh, that was a time where, where I could say my life changed forever and also my perception. And I'm not only talking about physical perception. So just to make a quick explanation of what cosmic rays are, Cosmic rays are protons that accelerate so much on black holes and also on supernovas and go uh, through space, got, get shot through space at the speed of light or near the speed of light uh, until they crash into a planet, an asteroid, and there's many, many, many cosmic rays falling right now in front of us. But as we don't have that sense, we cannot reveal the reality that's in front of us, even though it's happening at the time. So I did many uh, different prototypes. This was one of them uh, where I placed um, a bone conduction headpiece uh, so I could hear these cosmic rays inside of my skull without the need of taking away another sense, which was my, my, my hearing sense. And yeah, this is a partiture of how cosmic rays would sound like. And uh, it's really interesting, low pitch notes are cosmic rays that come from really far away, so are deaccelerated, and high pitch nodes are cosmic rays that come from closer, so they still maintain a lot of their speed. <laughs> so this is what I hear each time I place my exosense, because it's not implanted, my exosense, the cosmic sense. So, okay, I was 19 years old. I got my sense at the Cyborg Foundation Laboratories, which is a place in Barcelona. Uh, we like to call it the Cyborg Bunker, where we make all of our senses. It was created by Neil Harbison and Moon Rivas, and it's where we make all of our senses. So I went there, finished uh, this cosmic sense with an amazing team there. And then I went to New York because I had to present the sense for the first time on the Princeton University on New Jersey. So 19 years old, went to New York, uh, got into the hotel, placed my sense and went out to see what the city looked like. So I got into the metro and then I got to this place. And it was a really weird experience because I've always known what Times Square looked like, but it was the first time I was visiting it with a sex uh, sense. So I realized that the only sense that was not being caged, the only sense that was not being manipulated by marketing or by capitalism was my cybernetic sense. It was the only sense I had at the time that was allowing me to perceive pure nature. It's crazy, I think, uh, how much we're conditioned each time we walk out into a city by marketing. And the, uh, obviously, we need to live in cities. Many people would think you, you, can, you can just go uh, to the fields, you can just go to the woods. But as an artist myself, I consider that it's important to be in a city if you want to see art, if you want to consume it, if you want to meet other people who you can chat about it uh, in order to live like a modern human does, because this is what we've created ourselves. and. That's because this is something we needed, uh, right? So I thought, okay, how would this look like without any kind of advertising? And I found this picture, which is really interesting, about uh, Times Square without any types of advertising. And this is when I realized how much we are conditioned and we are caged by marketing, how much our five senses are not allowing us to perceive nature anymore, how much our surroundings have changed. This is another picture, it's the opposite game now. This is a picture that was taken many years ago of a really, really famous place in, uh, in the world. Um, and this place is actually Shibuya in Tokyo. So you can see the difference between this and this. And uh, this, in the end, is what we're perceiving. Sound, smell of the restaurants, uh, a giant McDonald's sign, H&M, 
everything is kind of tempting us to buy. You know, it's kind of playing with our dopamine and serotonin levels. It's kind of as if they know that we are addicts to, to dopamine, uh, and they obviously know it. So this is when I got to know about sensory marketing, which is basically a way of marketing that was invented in the 1998, or at least that is the moment where the name was given to the concept. And it's basically when marketing and advertisement is used by senses. So, um, for example, it's like walking into an environment like Apple stores that make you feel in a certain way thanks to the visuals, thanks to the sound, thanks to the smell. It's like when you walk into an Apple store, you might be even struggling with money, but you feel like you can afford an iPhone. That's part of your lifestyle, right? It's like uh, you see all those tables, you see the environment, you feel like that is your house, but it's, it's actually, it has nothing to do with what you find once you walk out of the store again with your 1000 uh, phone on your hand and your bank account empty. And I'm not hating on Apple because I'm a huge Apple lover, but uh, it, this is how it works. And it also happens with a Starbucks. I don't know if anyone here has studied marketing. Uh, I haven't studied marketing either, but I know that when you walk the first day into the marketing class, uh, it's usual that the teacher asks, what does Starbucks sell? And many people answer coffee. Um, but actually, Starbucks sells an experience. You walk into a Starbucks store, you smell the fresh coffee, which is probably an artificial smell. You hear the music, you see the people. Starbucks has created a creative hub, has created a co-working space, has created an experience itself, I would say. So this led me to the question, are we living on artificial environments? Are we living in man-made environments that have nothing to do with where we come from? We as humans obviously come from nature and technology, architecture uh, has, has grown so much in the past years that has led us to this, to the place we are at right now. And this led me to the question, are we living in these artificial environments? Are we conscious about how much of our senses are caged by these artificial environments? Let's imagine a dystopian future where this is what life looks like. You cannot walk a step out of your home. <clears throat> you cannot walk a step on any place without seeing an advertisement, either visual, uh, uh, hearing something, smelling something will be completely caged. It's not like I like to be pessimist, but I like to imagine dystopian realities, and this is one that I see, I think it's pretty possible. So I wonder what will the future human look like if this is what reality looks like? What will we do as humans that need dopamine races, that need serotonin races um, that are highly related to our perception and to our senses, if this is what our reality looks like. Designing yourself. That's what I thought. I, when I went into Times Square, the only sense, as I said, that was not cage was the cosmic sense. So I thought, in the future, we'll surrender our senses to the perception of natural phenomena we still can perceive. We'll create our own reality and we'll change our pure perception because the original five senses we are born with will be completely caged and jailed by marketing, advertisement, and the capitalist society we live in, by cities, by artificial environments themselves. So we'll alter our perception in order to free ourselves. It's kind of funny how the word cyborg has evolved so much until the moment it was created, but it kind of seems like we'll finally be changing ourselves instead of changing our surroundings in order to provide a safe environment for ourselves. And I think we can do that through cybernetic senses. Thank you very much. Cool. Uh, do we have any questions? Um, do you feel the cosmic like music every like all the time, like twenty four seven, or you can turn it off? Mm. Uh, when I started creating the cyborg sense, the uh, cosmic sense, um, uh, I thought about implanting it and. Uh, 
actually I have the cosmic sense back there. I usually use it in order to produce music because I'm a musician myself, but I don't constantly have it on. Cosmic rays are falling all the time in every part of the planet, so it's not like it interacts with the reality I interact with myself. So in the end, I use it more as a tool, but I got deep immersed into uh, cyber philosophy and I still wear this headpiece, which is an advanced version of my bone conduction headpiece that basically connects to Bluetooth. Uh, I've got two magnets implanted under my, uh, my skin, uh, so now I can hear through bone conduction Still, this is the part I took from, from that project, but now the Cosmic Sense uh, is just used for, for music creation. So, um, what is the rate that, I mean, like how frequent is it? Is, it's is it just as, as the... About that pace. As you heard, yeah, I don't know. Well, uh, do, do you remember I showed the... Yeah, that's a real Cosmic Ray audio. Uh, no, I understand. And that's... So it's, right, it's always like that? Or yeah, is it sometimes faster, sometimes slower? It's always... I mean, there's moments where it can change. And I actually thought about kind of trying to track or map uh, co where Cosmic Rays came from so I could know if there was a space phenomena going on outside of our planet that could be tracked for, uh, with Cosmic Rays. But as it's not... Uh, unilateral, you know, as it comes from everywhere, it was uh, super difficult. But yeah, there's moments where there's more high pitch cosmic rays than low pitch cosmic rays. It depends on what happens surrounding our planet and also in the universe itself. So magnetic uh, <laughs> effects as well, yeah. essentially, is determining that. Um, okay, so the uh, next question that I would have is, um, are you familiar in having built this 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 project and talking with people uh, and doing your research about uh, government projects in, in this area with implants? Uh. Um, not in government. Did, did you say government? Yeah. Yeah, no, not government, but more with other companies that work with uh, space exploration and this type of, of stuff. Yeah, I don't really think governments would be interested in cybernetics at the moment. Um, or at least not that we know. Uh, cybernetics, as, as I'd say, cyber guard, sensory exploration. But yes, I've worked with some other companies that work on space exploration itself. My next question would be, so I mean, you know, people are pretty willing to experiment with psychedelic drugs and other forms of conscious, uh, uh, manipulated consciousness or l different layers of consciousness. Um, could you explain maybe a relation or a contrast to having this extra sense? Uh, hmm. Does it bring you into any sort of sure. psychedelic state hmm. or does it bring you into any other higher cognitive state? What's it like? Yeah, I don't know if it's similar to the uh, to the state of taking psychedelics because I don't really relate it that much. I've taken psych psychedelics, obviously. Uh, actually, the first time I, I decided I wanted to make a sense, I was on psychedelics. Um, Barcelona, ayahuasca, what was Barcelona, it? Barcelona, no, not, not ayahuasca. Uh, but yes, I, have the, I, I find the relation in the fact that I feel like psychedelics kind of open up uh, the perception you have of reality, kind of mix together what's real uh, and what's tangible and what's not tangible. And with cybernetic senses, it almost happens the same. I feel like psychedelic drugs also kind of rebuild reality that's surrounding us, right? It's, you get more sensible to, at least for myself, to other other people's uh, energy, to say that way, uh, feelings to what happens. And I, I kind of feel like I can understand the vibration of everything. So with rebuilt reality in technology, it kind of happens the same. You're uh, seeing something, you're perceiving something with the five senses you cannot perceive. So it's kind of like an altered state of mind, but that is completely tangible. So Timothy Leary famously uh, said that um, that the brain is is like a tap, like a water tap, and it's we're constantly having the uh, you know all of our sensory information, and the brain functions is to reduce that to a level that we can maintain consciousness, but that that data is always there, and when you take LSD, that is like turning the faucet on full speed, yeah. and that's why you hear that's why you hear color, see sound, have synesthetic experiences. Totally. Um, but in the in the cybernetic sense, you're adding 
something mm. that's that's not there in our normally normal yeah. sensory data. Um, so it's not something that. Well, let, let me let me let me actually be a little bit more direct. Yeah. Now that you're aware of cosmic rays through your sen your extrasensory device, yeah, do you have any sense of that when you're not wearing it? Yeah, no. And consciousness of it, mm. ghost experiences. Uh, what no, I mean, what happened to me a lot is that when I dream and I I picture myself on dreams, I'm wearing the cosmic sense and I hear cosmic rays, but in reality, Moon Ribas, for example, is a post-cyborg. Uh, she took out the implants on her feet, <clears throat> and on the first day, she had been wearing it for a long, long time, constantly, so on the first day, she could feel the ghost vibration of the seismic movements, but it has nothing to do with the reality itself. She was not predicting the real movements of seismic uh, tectonic plagues in, in, in the planet, but she could still feel mm, <coughs> these movements. I feel like in the end, it's just your brain getting used to a new input and then trying to replicate it in order to maintain that same level and <clears throat> and I, I don't think the brain is, is adapted to drastic changes. So that's why these ghost things happen, I would say. It happened to me sometimes that it's super, super, uh, it's in super certain moments. Like if I don't wear it right now, I don't hear cosmic rays. So I'd also be curious about, <coughs> I mean, I've noticed over, over the course of my life of using tech and, and having communication devices, uh, the change in my sense of perception, the change uh, in my uh, in my depth of of, of uh, attention. Mm. Yeah. So now having an additional data source, mm. how do you compare having this additional data source with the effects that we're slowly becoming aware of having? You know, ongoing. Yeah. Uh, you know, messaging clients and ongoing, always on devices now. Yeah. yeah. It's it's so different actually because when you when you have a, an input that's constantly going on with you, if we had our phones implanted and we were hearing... <coughs> they might as the well be. <laughs> huh? They might as well be at this point. Yeah, yeah, some moment, I, I'm, I'm sure. But um, once you have an input that's constantly going on, for example, with the cosmic rays, what happened to me is that there's a point, there's a moment where you stop hearing them if you don't pay attention to them. So your brain Just regulates that. like when you live that. in the ocean. Right? Exactly, yeah, your brain regulates that. And I feel like with phones, as it's a constantly changing data that we're receiving, as we can take it on and off, we're constantly checking it and we're constantly uh, paying attention to it because we cannot expect what will happen with the information we receive. So that's what makes it addictive and different to having an external sense, that with the senses it's like do you kind of understand, your brain understands and regulates and um, kind of advances to what will come, so it, it kind of makes it easy for, for you to, to understand it and not be overwhelming. So then coming to the idea of, of dopamines and, and, mm. and, and uh, neurochemicals, uh, um, do you have a heightened sense of, I mean, do you have a more granular sense of your dopamine levels and of your other yeah, totally. uh, neurohormones? Totally. I mean, I think that happens to me because I have a severe ADHD, so I have uh, huge problems with dopamine uh, and serotonin. So uh, I, I really sense when I have a dopamine rise or when I have a dopamine fall, and I try to maintain that with some nutrients and stuff I take. But, but yeah, I think I have a huge perception, but that was before applying this sense to me. Okay, so, t so, so speaking then about uh, uh, neuro... Um um, nutrition. Um, have you experimented then with, you know, different uh, with different substances to see how it affects the perception of this data? Yeah, no, actually not. The only thing, so yeah, the only thing I take uh, on a daily basis is uh, five. Think HTP, 5-HTP, in order to regulate my dopamine levels, but it, it has nothing to do with my cybernetic sense. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry I'm, manipula <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm monopolizing the, the questions, but... <laughs> Thank you, sorry, I have another question. Have you um, experienced any like discomfort from the implant, and have you had any moments that you regret the decision of having the implant? Regretting it, you mean? Yeah, um, the first, when I implanted it, uh, the, the person, the anonymous person who implanted it to me um, really scared me out because uh, she told me that I could die, basically. Um, so, because of a blood infection or something like that. So, uh, the first days, I remember it was really swollen, so I regretted it in a sense that I felt I was about to die anytime. 
<laughs> but not in a sense that I regret submerging myself into cybernetics or adding parts into myself. Um, I've, I come from a really Catholic household, so for me, the fact of opening my body and the fact of modifying God's creation um, was a big change into the perception I had of, of the body, of the, my surroundings, of my life. So I never regretted that because it made me be more my uh, open-minded, uh, yeah, and uh, understand many more things, learn that everything I had learned before was just a social construct, and this this is something only Cybergism has given to me, and yeah. <laughs> so speaking of social con uh, constructs, uh, not only you have them, but we all have them oh, as everyone. observers yes. uh, of you as a, as, as a cyborg. Uh. So um, I'm curious, you know, what is, how is, the way that people perceive and and react to you changed? Has it been a positive change, a negative one? Uh, mm. Actually, uh, usually when people know about cybergism, I mean, if people know that what I'm wearing is because of cybergism, they tend to react in a positive way. But if they don't know it, they don't react in any way. They usually think I'm disabled. Um, and that's that's the reaction I get. Or that I'm just like a weird person experimenting with machines. But if someone... All three, all three of them are true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I would love to. Um, but actually, uh, no, if someone knows about cybergism, it's because they're interested in it and they usually see it as something positive. And if not, I've, I haven't really received that much hate a lot. I received a lot of hate of Christian people, like of Catholic people, uh, saying that I was the Antichrist and that I came here to, to, to end the world, but this is the only, <laughs> the only uh, stuff I got from people, yeah. Yeah, it's all, all, almost like a badge of honor. <laughs> um, Mitch, you've had a lot of, uh, a lot of contact with, with, with people that are experimenting with all kinds of, of technologies um, in this area as well, I think, and traveling the planet. Do you have any, any questions for Kai? Can I, like, poke you, maybe, to... Thank you very much. Right. Well, thank you uh, for being here, obviously. Okay, here we go. Thank you. Hello. You talked about having a sixth sense, and uh, there are people who have four or three, or a and um, there are medical applications to uh, to this kind of uh, thinking. Um, one of that I'm aware of um, were people who are suffering from Alzheimer or. Uh, Polygial palsy. Mm. Um, they're able to implant a small implant near the brain where it regulates the electricity current that goes into the brain. Um, others are going as far as talking about how the um, Pentagon or, or other defense uh, ministries are looking into creating the super soldier where if you're able to link the brain into a device, uh, you can download languages or maps and, uh, and so on. Do you think any of this is can you talk a little bit about this and do you think it actually makes sense or it's hmm. not real or and the other part that I'm really curious about um, your dreams w when you're sleeping h how how vivid how aware are you of your surrounding because of your device mm. <coughs> so answering to the first part of the question I think technology can well everything can always be used in many different ways it can be used for for good, it can be used for war, it can be used for anything. So it was obvious that as the technology is growing and it's uh, having this exponential growth, um, there would be uh, different appliances for it, right? For me, what I try to do with cybernetic senses has nothing to do with war or with this kind of transhumanist point of view, which I think it's more the point of view of these people who make this kind of devices in order to fight. Um, so I don't know if I can answer to your question of if it makes sense or not. From their point of view, it makes a lot of sense. From my point of view, I don't know if I like that way of using technology and cybernetic implantations. But there's many other ways that you can use it. You were talking about medical ways. For example, Neil Harbison, it's a medical appliance because he cannot see colors. Um, we have another cyborg here, which is called, uh, sh she's called Dodo. Um, she created a cybernetic sense for radioactivity uh, in order to help with her uh, autism, if I'm, if I'm right. Yeah, come on up and talk, tell us about you. Come on. 
<laughs> really? No, no, no. <laughs> the more the merrier. Uh, so, yes, no. Um, I didn't create it uh, because to help with my autism. I actually become, became cyborg because of my autistic um, view on reality. Because, like, it all began in 2019 when I met Neil Harbison at Futureport Prague Festival. And since I'm autistic, uh, I get, uh, we autistic sometimes tend to get so interest in some topic that it becomes our passion, our whole life. And this became, uh, this happened to me with cyborgism. So I realized how much I want to be a cyborg, how much I want to spread the cyborg art in the Czech Republic. So it's not that, uh, so like the cy uh, my cyborg sense is not some aid to help me with my autism, but it's a result of my autistic passion. <laughs> So if you are from Czech Republic and you want to join our cyborg movements, go to www.kyborgismus.cz kyborgismus.cz or contact Parallelní Polis and ask about Cyborgism Project. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, thank you very much. Uh, you can give it to him. <laughs> thank you very much. So yeah, there's many ways that cyborgism can be used in the end. And uh, I think I'm more interested into that side, into these kind of experiences, the stories. Um, well, I find it more fascinating. And talking about the second part, about the dreams, I, ca I tend to get uh, really lucid dreams, vivid dreams. So for me, dreaming is almost like transporting myself into a parallel reality. I actually try to generate um, with my mind a second planet Earth inside of the, my dreams that I could visit anytime I slept. They don't work, but there are some places that I, that I tend to visit a lot and that repeat. So I kind of transport myself into the dreaming stage. Not always happens. It depends on how I am uh, myself, but it's so vivid. So for me, uh, when I'm there, I just hear cosmic rays all the time, but I'm not wearing my cybernetic sense usually, but uh, it's there. It's, a, it's a, the perception I, I have inside of the dreams. And it started to happen four or five months after I started wearing my sense, because at first I would wear it constantly, 24-7. And uh, yeah, it stayed with me since then. Uh, at what point did you start speaking a second language? So I assume you speak Catalan and, and Spanish. Yeah. And w when, at what point did you start speaking English? Um, I started speaking English when I was like 12, no, when I was like 11 years old, because I got interested into, uh, this is so Gen Z, uh, but I, I got interested in two YouTubers that uh, only had English videos. So I kind of had to learn the language in order to understand them, and this is how I got to learn the, the English. And the reason that I ask you that is, do you remember the first time that you dreamed in English? No, I remember the first time I dreamt in Japanese, but uh, not, okay. the <laughs> not the first right, time so I dreamt so, in English. So, so same thing, mm. right? So. I'm making the comparison in having your first dream state yeah. in a second language mm. and having a first dream state with uh, augmented with augmented yeah. sensory data. It just feels so natural, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, you just don't think about it until you wake up and then you realize how weird it is. But I do remember the dream I was having when uh, and I got the first, uh, uh, the first cosmic rays on my dream. I was going down a hill in a medieval, um, not a car, but like, you know, un carro, como se, yeah. you know? Yeah, in a medieval card with my uh, DJ uh, best friend. And, uh, <laughs> and I started hearing Cosmic Rays, and I remember that surprised me. Not as when I heard Japanese for the first time on my dreams, but I really got conscious about, wow, I'm, I'm hearing Cosmic Rays inside of a dream, because I tend to have a lot of lucid dreams, so I know when I'm dreaming usually. Did you say VJ partner, so? DJ. DJ partner. DJ, okay. DJ. Right, okay, cool. Just to add more fantasy to the story. <laughs> Amazing. Wow, thank you so much for your openness you very and your much, willingness guys. to experiment and to, to be here on stage and, and share with us your experience. Thank you very much to, to all of you for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you.